Hi, Nick from Patchworks here. And today I'd like to talk about the SQ64, which is Korg's new uh, sequencer in the family along with like the SQ1. And this sequencer is actually very cool because it extends out the immediate playability of something like the SQ1 into something that is more gate focused, that can do polyphonic sequencing and still maintains a lot of interconnectivity with modular which is a big boon for the SQ-1. Um, affordable, well-built sequencer, very hands-on playable. And, but then you could just plug it into a modular and I use a few of them whenever I just need a sequencer. And the SQ-64 continues a lot of those same features. So let's go over some of those. When we see the build quality here, very similar to the SQ-1. Um, metal chassis, kind of a minimal design, all black. But now we have things like a screen and we have these kind of soft touch buttons instead of, well, the other one had soft touched aluminum, uh, soft touch illuminated buttons, but this one doesn't have those 16 knobs, but we can easily program notes on here. And not only can we program notes, but they can be polyphonic. We have three of those tracks here, A, B, and C. Those each allow you to sequence, I believe up to four notes per step and and that will really shine if you're driving other MIDI gear. We have two MIDI outputs here. They're using the TRS2 uh, or TRS MIDI, so you'll need an adapter. It doesn't actually come with any. Um, but you can hook up a keyboard and use that to sequence. And then likewise, you can run that out to other MIDI gear. Uh, but then what's exciting is right back here is where we have all of our modular outputs. So per, for A, B, and C, we get pitch and gate, which we expect but we also get mod, which is another sequence lane that allows you to do sort of automation recording, which is actually pretty cool because sometimes you do like to use pitch. I actually do this with my SQ1 is sometimes I'll use it for pitch, but other times I'll just use it to modulate things like cutoff frequency or scan different parts of samples. So although these are not polyphonic, if I do have polyphonic data on here, it's only going to play one note. There's no way around that. Um, and then here on the D track, if I hold this down, you can see here that we get these 16 pads and those correlate to 16 uh, gate tracks that can be run out of the MIDI section. But then here one through eight, we get eight gate tracks that can drive modular, which is great because a lot of sequencers that I like in modular sometimes either focus on um, more melodic stuff or more rhythmic stuff. And this actually kind of sits in between the two, which I really like. And I'll be going into more depth on how the D track and the ABC tracks can be programmed in this next section. Okay, so now you can see that I have the uh, SQ64 patched into my assimilator here. Um, obviously you could use any sort of, you know, drum, drum uh, engine, sampler, module, sound source, but I wanted to use the assimilator because it has tons of CV inputs and kind of just keeps everything contained into one thing. Um, the way that I have this patched up out of A, we're going into channel five here. Gives us this bell sound. Um, I wanted to pitch that up and down. So here in CVA, that's gonna give me my one volt per octave info out of channel six. Kind of have that like uh, resonant stab uh, again, same sort of patch, gate in for B, and then uh, pitch going into CVA. Um, one trick I did here, which, you know, when I'm, when I'm programming here, I see uh, 16 steps of track A, B, C, D. D has 16 drum tracks in it, and right now, maybe they'll fix this in the future, but it'd be nice if I could see all, maybe four rows of D at once but to alleviate some of that, and I'm not doing any pitch stuff with C, C is actually just patched directly into my hi-hat, uh, which sounds like this. And then D right now, if I hold this down, it's pointing to channel one, which is my kick, and channel two will be my snare. Oops, my snare is actually over here. Cool. So when I start programming here, you know, it's good. for the step sequencing, we'll get a hi-hat pattern going. I like to have sort of like a hi-hat metronome, so it's as easy as going, one, four, one, four, or one, five, nine, like that. And there we go, nice. So that's my hi-hat, and D right now is pointing to D1, so let's get my drum, my kick doing the same thing. 
pretty easy. Let's do my hi hats on the ands. And say if I want to do that snare drum. Now to actually get that, there's a few different ways we could do that. I could either hold down D and go to D2, which replaces this with D2, which is cool. Pretty easy to hop between my drum tracks there. Or I could just see that on a view of its own. Say if I wanted to um, do that, I just hit D and now we're looking at D2. And this view is cool because, let's see, right now we have a 16 step sequence. Let's change that to make this one be 64 steps. So I'll hold down shift, and if I rotate steps, then we get a lot more steps. Let's do 64, and I can just get my pattern going there. So now on that last bar, it's gonna be playing the uh, the kick on a different pattern, not the kick, the, the snare on a different pattern. So I'll go to my kick, and we'll program our kicks back into that too. There we go. So D track, even though I wanted that snare just to be 64 steps, the D track is all those drum tracks and those can't be uh, polymetric with each other. So now my kick's going, we got that going, that's nice. My hi-hat's still on a on a 16 step sequence, which is cool. And one thing I like to do with my hats is do kind of polymetric stuff. So instead of steps of 16, I could just rotate these encoders, which I didn't go over, but uh, one, two, three, four correspond to encoder one, two, three, four. It's pretty easy. But if I say 15, now you can see, now we're getting kind of a polymetric hi-hat against something that's kind of square on that four for my track D. So that's pretty easy. Nice, nice and simple gate programming using this one interface. Again, our 64 step sequences, we could zoom in and see those all there. But also if we wanted to see that from this view where we see all of our parts going at once, I can just click on these um, these pages here. One, two, three, four correspond to each of those 64 step pages. And you can see that these aren't illuminated because those each have steps of 15, 16, 16. So that's a pretty easy way to just start programming drums. If I didn't have any pitch stuff, honestly, I would use A, B, and C as my drum tracks to allow me to see all those pages at once. One of my favorite sequencers is the Metron and to have all those pages of gates at once is a really great way to program. But what this has over the Metron is that melodic sequencing, which we'll dive into and look at on channel A and B. So with this, you know, we got our pattern here. That's our drum pattern, that's cool. A and B are our melodic thing, our melodic tracks. Um, I could program it the same sort of way. If I click A, right now, you see how this is flashing? That means that I'm only seeing track A. So these are not B, C, and D. Like I can extend a number of steps and it's still all track A, um, but I don't want to do that. What I want to do is click this and now we see A and B. So if we wanted to program it the same way, I could just arbitrarily, you know, turn on steps. So on bar one, we'll get four hits on A, bar, not bar two, beat one. Beat two is gonna be four hits on B and so on. Pretty easy, right? But that's that's rhythmic. That isn't actually doing anything with this wonderful sequencer that actually can do note data really easily. So the way that I would want to program that, honestly, would be going over to this pitch page here. It will give me these, um, well, 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 actually, there's a combo here. If I hold down A and then pitch now, or pitch and then A. Again, order operations matter. And I like to show those mistakes in these videos because sometimes you, we think, oh, we could hold down A and then pitch or pitch and then A. You know, it's, it's okay to make those mistakes, but going in and, and learning what those are gets you kind of quicker and more fluent with these devices. But now you can see here that these turned into my keyboard. And right now we're in the scale of minor. Um, I went in and in global, we can change what that keyboard is. So this is like isomorphic, kind of like how guitar frets are set up or like a push uh, sequencer controller for Ableton would be like. Um, but I could have it be keys, which is chromatic. Um, I'll show you that here. So pitch A, now we have, you can see that these white keys here that are, or more illuminated towards you are your white keys and these ones that are away from you and dim, those are your black keys. But I love quantized stuff, pitch quantized stuff. So let's go back to global. Um, 
and let's see, global, and go in and change that back. Uh, keyboard to isomorphic. And with this global menu, if you've played around with, you know, other Korg stuff, this menu actually is very familiar to like Minilog, Monolog, Prolog users. Um, each of these lit little uh, red boxes are our different menu pages. So, you know, you could either click on them and you remember, hey, this is the one that has keyboard, or you could just use your encoder and, um, or you could just hit global and that will page through those automatically for you. So let's go back over to A, hold down pitch and then A, back in keyboard mode. So now we could hear off of A that our gates are firing and our pitch data is being sent as well. So to program, I could hit play and then I could just hold down a step and then push a key and that will put that, put that note on that step. And it's pretty easy to go in. You can see that it's really easy for me to go in and start changing these notes live because I just hold down the step and push the key, easy. Cool, so we got our bells going. Let's go over to B, do the same thing. Pause it for a second. So with B, notice this. I think this is a setting that we could change too, but I can actually trigger these notes when the sequencer stop, but when it's playing, it won't let me do that. And that's because it wants to prefer the sequencer over the keyboard, which totally makes sense. You know, if the sequencer is going and it's fighting against the keyboard, that would be hard, but I could actually live play it in. So let's hit play there and go. And so that's really cool because, again, these things aren't really tuned to each other. This is just a quick demo of the features. But, you know, you can build things live by live recording things into it, which is which is nice with the sequencer. There's a lot of Eurex sequencers that don't allow live recording into them. Something like the SQ-1 is mostly just a bunch of knobs. So what you see is what you get. But this one has a record. You could use the built-in keyboard or you could plug in your own MIDI controller there and still get that same sort of functionality. Um, and the scale was equal temperament. It wasn't even minor. So I'll show you how to delete that. I don't like the sequence. So I go over to patterns. I go action. I could switch this over to clear. That was B. I hit clear, clear pattern. Yes. Okay. So now, cool. So now let's go back over to our pitch. We're on B. We don't have the keyboard there. Hold down pitch B. Now we have the keyboard. So let's try it again. Still sounding kind of funny because we're not using things that are kind of related to each other, but now, and my scale's back to equal. So that's another thing. If you clear your pattern, the scale is associated with the pattern. So let's go back in here and try this one last time. We'll clear it, boop, yes. All right, cool. And then go back over here, pitch, pitch B, keyboard, Equal, we do minor. Yeah, that sounds a lot better to my ear. <laughs> cool. I like that quite a bit more. All right, so now we have essentially this first sequence done. I could say first sequence done, but that's a little um, deceiving because one of the cool features is A, B, C, D, each are their own patterns. So you know, even though we program these all at the same time, if I wanted to say change A a little bit and have like a, a separate pattern, you can see that this whole row is patterns for A and this whole row is patterns for B. They just all happen to be programmed at the same time and in the same column. So let's make like a, a different part of A. Let's just tune it up a little bit. Uh, by tune up, I mean maybe transpose up a few notes. So I could copy stuff. If I wanted to do that, I click the pattern I want to copy like, like that. Turn this to copy and pick my, you can name your patterns. I'm not gonna do that for this example. And then I pick my destination. So we're copying this one and I hit here. Do you wanna copy pattern? Yes. Cool. So we get that, oh, cancel. I don't wanna do that a second time. It already went. So now when we play, it'll actually sound the same. We have to switch this back to select. Here we go. Okay. And so now I'll go into my, my pitch again, go over to A. And now this part's really easy because this 
the workflow is great here, where I could just hold down my button here for the pitch data on the pitch page, and it tells me what I played, a C. If I want to change that, I could just turn this knob here. Nice, D. There's an easy way to transpose it too. We could actually just use this uh, this knob here and it'll just transpose everything. So if there's, and I, I was wrong at the beginning, we could actually do eight notes per step. But if there were chords here, it would actually transpose the whole chord for you, or you could invert it. So there's these very clever ways to manipulate your patterns using these encoders if you hold down the step here. Uh, kind of like parameter locking you'd see on other devices, even with our gates here. Say if I go in this hi-hat pattern, we have our length offset, so it doesn't even have to be strictly on the uh, on the sequencer and probability. So we could either do it, you know, two out of every three times it'll play, or we could use probabilities. 75% of the time it'll play, 65% of the time it'll play. Um, but going back over here to the pitch of A, D, G, sure, we'll just transpose these all willy-nilly, see what kind of nice, fun stuff we could get. And the transpose is going to keep things in key. If I use this one, it goes back to chromatic. F sharp is not a member of a of the uh, the minor the C minor scale. But if I use this, this transpose. Interesting. We'll we'll cut that part out. <laughs> Don't worry about the transpose thing. So now we're going back in. Say something like, yeah. So, you know, we, we, we edit some of our steps here, and we'll hear how it sounds and bounce between the two patterns. Okay, so here's... And then we go... To, there's... Nice. So now we are actually able to go between and start sequencing new patterns like that, and it's you know, kind of sky's the limit from there. You know, one uh, some of the other features I want to show you really quickly are just kind of cool things you could do with your with your sequencer while you're playing live. Um, if we go back over to gate here, if I wanted to do something like, for example, make if I hold down shift here, you could see that all of my sequencers are uh, divisions of sixteenths. But if I wanted to slow down one. So now A is on an A pattern and maybe <laughs> make that go 30 seconds. So we can do some really crazy things with our sequences. But then I could make these all polyrhythms. If I wanted to reset them, I could even, if I hit resynchronize A, it resets that particular sequencer. Which is pretty fun, especially once you start messing around with these steps. You know, I like to do this a lot with my compositions. Like, I'm not very intentional with writing melodies. I like to keep things quantized and in keys. And then I like to play around with how the sequences are moved about. So when I do stuff like that, I hit play. They're all reset. We could either resync these to get variants, or we could use some of these different uh, traversal methods. We have reverse, which will play the sequence backwards, bounce which will kind of, you know, pendulum, stochastic, uh, I think that's what it is. Um, essentially what that'll do is like Brownian motion, it will kind of move back and forth. It's not true randomness. So let's try that one on, on here and we'll see stochastic. Um, you can see how these move, which is great. Cause yeah, the sequence isn't really near and dear to my heart. It's not a melody. If people don't hear that melody, it's not the end of the world, but it's more about those notes that I have in there in interesting ways that don't repeat things. So that's a great way, or we could do true randomness. So now you can see that this one's truly random, and this one's doing that kind of Brownian motion. Um, and other things we could do too, in the shift menu, I could mute pretty easily. So maybe my kick. So like this shift menu is really great. It's kind of a performance menu for mangling your sequences while they're playing. Um, but yeah, we have these gate gate um, parameters. When I hold down the, the node, I'll be able to change those. Pitch we saw we could change. There's like a really, this thing's sophisticated. I'm not even gonna touch half the features, but uh, we have different transposition methods, different arpeggiators. We could change the octave from this menu. Mod, these are just arbitrary CV amounts or CC amounts for MIDI. Loop is a really fun menu 
It's another way of moving across your patterns. Um, kind of akin to like active step mode on SQ1. Say if we just want to loop these three uh, notes on track C, I could just hit the start and end. And see, now it's just going to go across those three until I double click it and then it'll resume. That's what the resume in phase is. If I say resume free, then when I do this, you can see that I'll get caught in there and then I'll double click and then it just continues again. So, so let's stop this and let's get our patterns back to just being, you know, kind of in time to play around more with the loop. So then, yeah, we could just... And then we could do crazier things too where, you know, while that's looping, I could go and start rotating the, the sequence. So once I go out of that loop, it's it caught in there only when the loop's engaged. But then I could go back to B, rotate the whole sequence. So that's just going to take my notes and literally rotate them. So that's my A that actually does that. So loop, freeze it, rotate. Different part gets caught in that loop. Go back over here, rotate, loop. So this is just some tricks that I'm kind of coming up with live as I'm playing with this. I've spent uh, a little bit of time with this, but like I said, there's still tons of features that I haven't even breached. But the thing that's super promising about this is that there are a lot of cool sequencer tricks that you can do both in terms of ease of view sequencing and live performance tricks. Um, but yeah, hopefully, you know, we'll have these in stock soon. I know that uh, it's been kind of a wait, but I think the wait is well worth it. So uh, always feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And like always, have fun patching.